2010 figures to be a monumental year for Iraq. Seven years after the U.S. invasion, America wants out, planning to withdraw all but 50,000 troops by August. It's days away from the national elections and their legitimacy is already in doubt, with major parties boycotting and rumors of fraud rampant. In the North, tensions mount as Kurds and Arabs fuel an old feud. Will this pivotal year lead to civility or civil war? It is a fault line, yes. But will it have to be a bloody civil war where it will be the end of this thing? No. If Kirkuk is a battleground, then the prize lays beneath us. Experts estimate that up to 25% of Iraq's oil is here. That's enough of a natural resource bonanza to fuel an independent Kurdistan, a fact that both Erbil and Baghdad are both keenly aware of. And with neither side willing to compromise, Kirkuk may very well be the fault lines that Iraq's future depends on. These days, it's often police, not military, who find themselves in the forward edge of a frontless war. Such as these highly militarized cops preparing to raid three Arab villages south of the city from Kirkuk province. It's 4.30 in the morning, we're with Kirkuki police on a mission for uh, what they call terrorist hunting. The eerie golden glow illuminates the night sky from enormous oil filled flames that never stop burning. Ever present reminders of the spoils for the victor in the battle for Kirkuk. As calls for morning prayer break the night silence, dogs announce our arrival. Police set up a staging area in the village schoolyard. Cops build a fire to warm themselves on this painfully cold morning. <laughs> while all the men in the village are roused from their homes and brought to wait in line. Every male must present his national identification card to be checked against a list of most wanted names before being cleared to return to his family. This morning, four men aren't so lucky. One is apprehended when his name is found to be a direct match to the list. Three others are brought in without warrants for their arrest based on partial name matches. Today's mission happens without incident for the police, but they tell us it's far from the norm. Just in my department, we have lost more than 150 officers. More than 300 officers have been wounded. They have tried to kill me a number of times by using car bombs, suicide attacks and shootings. They tried to poison us three times. They ended up poisoning us once, but we survived. It was a miracle. In Kirkuk, the police force is mostly controlled by Kurds. The insurgents they chase, mostly Arab. It's just one part of the Arab-Kurdish divide that exists here, and it's a volatile mix. Kirkuk is an outpost town. Whether it's the northern edge of Arab lands that slope from here to North Africa, or the southern point of a Kurdish people who stretch from Syria to Iran, depends on who you ask. Iraq, Kurdistan. 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 Kurdistan? Yes, yes. Iraq. 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 Why? Why Iraq? Kirkuk should be part of Iraq. We have all lived like brothers here, Kurd, Arab, and Turkmen. We would like to continue living that way. As with everything in Iraq, there are always more than two sides to every story. To add to the complexity of the Arabs and Kurds in Kirkuk, a sizable population of Turkmen maintain close relations to Turkey, whose economic and military clout looms over much of what happens here. And each faction believes it has history on its side. The Turkmen point to when the Ottoman Empire ruled here, which is true. Uh, we know uh, the, the most of lands uh, of Kirkuk belongs to the Turkmens, and uh, we didn't see any uh, period in the history that uh, Kirkuk was uh, some a part of uh, Kurdistan. The Kurds argue that before Saddam forced them out, they were the majority, which is true. Saddam forced tens of thousands of Kurds to vacate Kirkuk. He then moved Arab families north into the city, 
to secure control of the valuable oil territory for the ruling minority of Sunni Arabs. To us, Kirkuk is about redress of that historic injustice uh, manifested in, in ethnic cleansing and deportation. While Arabs tend to acknowledge the policy of Arabization, they argue that Arabs have long lived in Kirkuk and that because they're all Iraqi, Kirkuk belongs to Iraq, which is true, as long as Kurdistan stays a part of Iraq. Since we became occupied, we got divided into this province and that province. Kirkuk is Iraqi. We will never compromise over it. It will never go to another province. The dispute has taken center stage in a larger collision of forces that's now being called the trigger line. From Syria to Iran, Iraqi army forces are positioned across from Kurdish security forces called Peshmerga. All along this trigger line, there have been incidents, any one of which could have triggered uh, a, a larger conflagration. And the only reason why it didn't was because both sides recognized that this was not what they wanted at that time. This is the Herb Mill Technical Institute, and this is a party to celebrate their first day of classes. You can tell it's a level of security harmony here that may not exist in the rest of Iraq. Erbil is the capital of the Kurdistan region, numbering close to 30 million. The Kurds are the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, but a minority in every country they inhabit. Iraqi Kurdistan is a semi-autonomous region that borders Syria, Turkey, and Iran, all countries with sizable Kurdish populations of their own. To really understand the anger, hurt, and distrust of Baghdad that fuels Kurdish identity, you need to come here to Halabja, a village on the Iranian border where in 1988, Saddam's army killed thousands of Kurds. We looked up and saw birds were falling from the sky into our yard. The people in our basement were panicking, their eyes were turning red, and some of them were throwing up. Lukman Mohammed has horrific memories of that day. He lost his mother, two brothers, two sisters, and a wife of three months. Like many connected to Halabja, he views the issue of Kirkuk as directly linked to past aggressions against the Kurds. We have made a lot of sacrifices. If we look at the Kurdish history, we gave up a whole revolution for Kirkuk. The chemical bombardment of Halabja, the Anthal campaign, all happened because of our struggle for Kirkuk. We have shed so much blood for it. Why wouldn't we want it to be part of our region? Kirkuk is the eye through which we see the world. Kurdish leaders are quick to remind people of the horrors of Halabja. In fact, Kurdish leaders so frequently used the cause of Halabja that locals became frustrated with being the poster children for Kurdish suffering, while at the same time not receiving any support to rebuild their town. In 2007, they rioted and burned down the memorial built for the tragedy. With memories like Halabja still fresh, distrust of Baghdad has become a survival instinct for the Kurds. But that suspicion runs both ways. Iraq Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki has repeatedly expressed frustration with the Kurdish leader's, quote, separatist tendencies. It's not difficult to see why. If the Kurds want independence, it is their rights. They can declare it, and they, we, can, we can say it without inhibition. Kurdish president, Masoud Barzani, has been a vocal critic of Maliki and the central government. You were referring to Maliki uh, as wanting to restore a dictatorship in Iraq. How much do you trust Maliki, and do you still think he wants to be a dictator in Iraq? That is not a personal issue, of course. We have many reservations over the way the Iraqi army and police were restructured and reorganized. I'm hoping in the next election, the future government is able to solve this issue. So. I'm, I'm unclear. Do you, do you believe that Maliki wants to restore a dictatorship in Iraq? I don't want you to ask this question again. Driving through Kirkuk, it's easy to see how the city is changing. Waves of Kurds have been moving into Kirkuk since 2003. For long stretches, recently built gray concrete homes pop up everywhere. They're a visual testimony of the city's shifting demographics. Many Arab and Turkmen see the Kurds' mass migration as a political maneuver, an attempt at a demographic takeover. They claim many more Kurds are returning than have ever lived here before. We challenge all those who make such accusations against the Kurds. 
If they find one extra Kurd or any non-Kirkuki Kurd living there, we will take responsibility for it. I can assure you that 40% of those Kurds which were expelled from Kirkuk are still living in Suleimania and Erbil and have not gone back. These are false accusations against us. Uh, they brought these people to, uh, to vote yes in the referendum. The referendum was part of an Iraqi constitutional measure that called for Kirkukis to vote on joining Kurdistan or remaining part of central Iraq. When Kurds started moving into the city by the tens of thousands, and some claim hundreds of thousands, the debate came about who should be able to vote. Some criticized the Kurdistan regional government's aggressive repatriation program. They are doing things that are not as so nice to some of these Kurds, because some of these Kurds don't want to go back, or at least not now. Um, if they are employed in the civil service in Erbil or Suleimania, for example, their jobs may be transferred to Kirkuk and they have no choice but to move at least during the day. Um, if they have children born to them, uh, they are being forced to register these children in Kirkuk. Uh, if they want to buy land in Suleimania, they're not allowed to do so. I think for the courts, Kirkuk is important because the Kirkuk's oil and the Kirkuk gas. Uh, it is an economic sources to the KRG. Uh, the Kirkuk it will be any uh, very important strategic uh, value for the KRG. You mean for an independent KRG? Yes, yes, yes. which means ready to die, were born from a fighting unit of the Ottoman Empire. They later emerged as a Kurdish icon, fighting for independence against both Iran and Iraq. The Constitution allows for regional guards like the Peshmerga, which claims to have 60 to 70,000 troops. But this force is clearly intended to guard against more than threats to the nation of Iraq. We are not afraid of the Iraqi army, but we are afraid of how it is managed. That it might not be used to establish freedom and democracy, but be used to eliminate others. History has shown us that the Iraqi army has been used to intimidate Iraqi people, especially the people of Kurdistan. The U.S. military is battling this deficit of trust by establishing new trilateral checkpoints along the trigger line, run by units from both sides with oversight by Americans. But not everyone's so keen about having a Kurdish military presence in northern Iraq. Sunni politicians have made a recent comeback in the province of Nineveh, partially due to their outspoken opposition to the Kurdish presence there. Security forces are escorting us into the city of Mosul. Mosul is the capital of the Nineveh province and is one of the most violent cities in Iraq right now. Much of the violence in Mosul is attributed to recent ethnically driven politics. Mosul has a majority Sunni population, but because Sunnis boycotted the 2005 elections in protest to the U.S. occupation, the government was controlled by the minority Kurds. Then in provincial elections last year, Sunni candidates ran and won on a strong anti-Kurd platform. In response, Kurdish politicians rejected the results and are refusing to participate in a coalition government. The Kurdish political parties and the Kurdish coalition, I am not convinced they comprehend the change. It is hard for those in power to give up authority and to relinquish their agenda that came after the occupation of Iraq. They must accept the results of the election and the results of democracy. The governor of Nineveh province, Adil al nujafi has been outspoken in his opposition to the joint checkpoint idea. Once the Peshmerga established their presence beyond the accepted border of Kurdistan, he says they won't want to leave. We believe that this is part of the greater Kurdistan agenda. They know that there cannot be a state created in the areas where they are now because of the weakness of its economic resources, its lack of geographical interconnectedness and lack of access to a seaport. For that reason, they have a dream of a greater Kurdistan. They have plans for that. The governor of Mosul said he, he does not want the Iraqi army to patrol jointly with the Peshmerga. He has no interest in that. Uh, what's your response to him on that issue? 
Our agreement is with the Baghdad government and also with the U.S. military. We have not and we will not talk to the governor of the Nineveh province. We will not recognize his decision and his decisions will not be implemented on the ground. The balance of power in this area is known. The Iraqi Arab side was at its weakest point after the occupation and now is starting to gradually regain its power. I'm sure that the Kurdish leaders will reassess the situation in light of the new power facing them. What about what the Kurds will do in the face of this new power? U.S. military commanders have proposed leaving 20,000 troops in northern Iraq, while forces around the rest of the country withdraw. As the U.S. military pulls out, it's handing over increased security responsibilities, not only to the Iraqi army, but also to the local police, who face constant danger. We're rolling with the Kukuki police today in a joint patrol with the U.S. military. Tensions are high. A half hour before we arrived, two police officers were gunned down in the streets. The last time we met with the Kukuki police, there was an attack that killed three bodyguards of a police commander and another police officer. This kind of violence is a daily occurrence here and is one of many things that could undermine the upcoming elections. Leading the operation is Police Brigadier General Sahar Khadr. He was once the police chief in the Kurdish city of Erbil, but moved to Kirkuk after 2003. He doesn't hide the fact that he came here to secure the city for the Kurds. When we were Peshmergas in the 80s, our goal was to change the regime in order to gain our rights. When America and the Allied nations removed the previous regime, we came back to our city to save what we had left. Kirkuk is a city the Kurds shed a river of blood for. This is a fact that cannot be denied. <laughs> <laughs> They're visiting the sheikh of a Sunni village in the Kirkuk province. It's a chance to smoke, drink tea, and talk about security preparations for the upcoming elections. This house call is also an attempt to mend fences after the U.S. detained and released the sheikh without charges. Beyond the walls of the meeting and the shadows of the heavily armed police and U.S. soldiers, villagers were eager to talk about their perspective on the status of Kirkuk. The Kurds say this is Kurdistan. Historically, this is Kurdistan. Impossible. Impossible. In actuality, this is Iraqi land, not Kurdish or Arab. The Kurd is living in Baghdad, living in Ramadi, living in Samarra, living in all the provinces of Iraq. We have the right to live anywhere inside Iraq we want, not just here. If we reside inside, we have the right. These men echoed a similar sentiment that's common in these Arab communities, brutality at the hands of Kurdish security forces. Inside the village, it's fine. If people go to the administrative seat of the province, they don't come back. The president of our legislative council was killed on the street here. He and his son were killed. The parties nailed him. The Kurdish parties assassinated him. Stories of assassinations, kidnappings and intimidation are commonplace here. Sunnis claim it's a concerted campaign to force Arabs out of Kirkuk. Kidnappings have become so endemic that Kirkuk has created an official committee to look into them. Ramla Hamid al ubaidi has investigated hundreds of disappearances. The number of parents that have come to us in the northern area are in the range of 600 to 800. What I mean by kidnapping is that arrests are made unofficially and illegally. They might come to the door of someone's home, posing as an official of the government, and take him. General Qatar is dubious about the kidnappings. That is a big lie, and it is very far from the truth. When you accuse people of such acts, you must have proof to back up your accusation. You are a journalist. Why don't you go find and interview someone who alleges that we have kidnapped them, and taken them to prison in Orbil or Sulaymaniyya, and you put them on TV for the whole world to see? So we did. My son, a soldier, was on the main road to Kirkuk. We were waiting for him to come home on vacation, April 12, 2009, but he never arrived. Witnesses say that Abdullah's 17-year-old son, Man, was stopped in his car by Kurdish intelligence officers and taken away. The family claims they've been extorted for thousands of dollars seeking information about where their son is being held. We're going through tough and sad times. We lost our son and our monetary support as well. We're still not sure of where he is, what he was accused of, and when he'll be let go. 
I got diabetes and high blood pressure, and his mother has suffered from difficulty breathing after the kidnapping. Unfortunately, these accusations have been made a lot of times. Like I mentioned before, these are the kind of remarks that some people make that create problems. We challenge all of them to go to the prisons in Kurdistan to see if there are any prisoners there from Kirkuk. In Suleimania, we actually visited a prison. By chance, the committee entered one of the halls, and I asked, who among you has family that doesn't know where you are? Quickly, four people raised their hands, so we recorded their names. Then they realized that they were being observed somehow and became all quiet. I contacted their families, and one of them had been lost for six months, and his family had no idea where he was. I think that the Kurds, by and large, have not engaged in the kind of violence that, uh, let's say, the, the former regime used in expelling the Kurds. Um, the Kurds have used subtler methods, but they have a similar uh, impact, which is the, the departure of uh, Arabs uh, from Kirkuk. There's a precarious moment at hand in northern Iraq. As seismic shifts in power and control destabilize an area with rich strategic importance. Now Kurds and Arabs are locked in a dangerous struggle for the best position to take advantage of the power vacuum that will surely open when the U.S. departs. I mean, look, we live here, and it's a tough situation. But the communities of Kirkuk, the leaderships of the Kurds and Arabs and others have always, I mean, we have been pushing the envelope back and forth, but almost every, every time we stopped off the brink line and came back. If the Kurds do that and take Kirkuk, there will be a large contingent of Arabs and Turkmen who will move against them, who will work to weaken security and try to regain the city. Basically, there wouldn't be any Kurds here if it wasn't for the Americans. Saddam Hussein expelled them, denied their identity and their presence. The U.S. brought them back in this ugly condition. It did not bring back civilized Kurds. If America leaves without deciding what happens in Kirkuk, leaving Kirkuk as it is now, then can you describe what would happen? Within an hour, there will be a fight and the Kurds will be expelled. <laughs>